Okay, we can get started, I think. Uh, even if you have some late stragglers, that shouldn't matter. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Nazem Chichik. I'm the Associate Dean of Research for the Faculty. It's really a great pleasure to introduce you to uh, one of my long-standing colleagues and our seminar speaker today. So Professor Danny Mann grew up in Western Manitoba, where he attended school in Roblin and was introduced to the profession of agriculture on the family farm. Then he received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Agricultural Engineering in 1992, his MSc degree in Biosystems Engineering in 1995, and a PhD in Biosystems Engineering in 1998. Then he joined the Department of uh, Biosystems Engineering here in the faculty at the U of M in 98, and actually has served in many capacities, including department head, since 2009. Danny has research expertise in agricultural ergonomics, agricultural safety, and assistive technologies. His research bridges the disciplines of agricultural engineering and ergonomics. His current research aims to understanding how to incorporate real-time sensor information into an automation interface to enable remote supervision of autonomous agricultural machines, and you're going to hear much more of that today. Danny is a registered professional engineer with, with Engineers and Geoscientists Manitoba and has been a member of the Canadian Society for Bioengineering since 1998. He recently completed a two-year term as president. He's received the CSP Young Engineer of the Year Award in 2006, while he was still young, the Glenn Downing <laughs> I'm, Award I'm in, recogni <laughs> in recognition uh, of outstanding work in the area of power and machinery in 2011, was elected fellow of the society in 2019, and received the Maple Leaf Award in 2022 in recognition of leadership in the profession. Danny has also rec been recognized for teaching by the graduating class on two occasions in 2009 and 10 and 2019, and received the Excellence in Engineering Education Award from the Price Faculty of Engineering in 2020. And most recently, Danny was a 2021 recipient of the Biosystem Engineering Alumni of Influence Award. So without further ado, I invite Danny up. Please help me welcome. Thank you, Nazem. Welcome, everyone. Uh, What I'm going to, uh, to do today in this presentation is give you a bit of a, a snapshot of, of my research program over the last 23 years, 24 years. When I was, when I was hired, uh, I, was, I, did a, I did a great sales pitch. Yeah. I was trained, uh, Dig Verjeus was my uh, PhD advisor, my, my master's and my PhD advisor, so I, I was trained in the area of grain storage. But the position that was, was open in the department at the time was, was a position more focused on agricultural machinery. And I convinced the search committee that I would be able to make that transition. And, and although it maybe wasn't always completely smooth at that transition, I think it was, it, it did allow me to uh, perhaps develop a, a unique uh, perspective with respect to machinery. And that's, that's really what I'm going to, uh, to focus on uh, today, is how this, how this program, uh, research program evolved. We're certainly going to talk about autonomous tractors, but in 1998, the autonomous tractor at that point, you know, it was more of a concept, of, you know, still a very far-fetched concept. There were, there were a lot of intermediate steps that have been taken along the way, and that's, I'm going to try to give you a glimpse of that. So, the origins of a research program. Uh, for many years, I, I just moved back uh, into the city this past summer, but for the last 20 years I lived in Sanford and commuted uh, into the city every, every day. And this is what one of the fields that, I don't remember what year it was, but I was commuting past and I, I stopped and took a picture of this and I thought, you know, this, this really symbolizes what, you know, what, what the problem is. So my suspicion is that actually what, what happened was that one of the nozzles on the sprayer was plugged and that as the, 
farmer was spraying, it, you know, it was leaving one, one row that was not treated with herbicide and allowed the thistles to grow. That's probably what happened. I'm choosing to interpret it differently. This is exactly what would happen if I was the operator and I was driving in error and I was, I was driving too far apart and I was leaving a row that would be not treated. And so, you know, the idea of precision agriculture, this was really what, what farmers are trying to avoid. Avoid leaving strips where there is no pesticide applied, no fertilizer applied, no seed applied, and so forth. So this was sort of the origins, the quest to eliminate lateral error. Getting a sense of, of you know, the, how long that I've been working on this, this, this picture, the, the uh, technology that's shown in the, these slides, that was something that I purchased with, with my startup funds. It was called a cam track system. This was the latest and greatest technology at the time. It consisted of this little camera that you would mount somewhere on, on your implement in a forward uh, looking direction. And then this, this very, and this is, was not a very big monitor, it was literally about this big, that you would mount onto your, in your cab somewhere and there was a, this was long before the idea of wireless communication. <laughs> so there was a long cable that connected from wherever you put that camera on the end of your sprayer back to the cab. And whatever the camera saw, you would see on the, on the monitor. So, you know, the idea was that if you're, if you're spraying with a, a, a boom that is 100 feet wide, instead of trying to guess where the end of the boom is, You've got the camera placed there and you've got then that bird's eye view of what the camera is seeing. And so we bought this, this uh, piece of technology and my first master's student started to, to play around with this and you know, try to figure out what could we, what kind of impact could we make in terms of, of recommendations to farmers. And one of the first things that we, we quickly realized is that the placement of the camera was critical in terms of the information that was available to the driver. So, you know, just, you know, looking at the geometry by raising the camera or by focusing on that, that tilt angle, you ended up with a different, in that, in that schematic, a different D that was being seen by the camera. When you think of this, I mean, it, in static terms, it maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but as soon as you think about that tractor that the camera is moving forward, all of a sudden you have basically what we described as image velocity. So on this tiny little screen, that picture is just scrolling by, and you know, we're telling the farmer, you can't see what's happening out there, so look at this little screen and watch this rapidly scrolling um, image and figure out what you're supposed to do, whether you're supposed to turn left, turn right, and so forth. And so we, we were able to prove that, or show that the performance measured in, in lateral error declined as this image velocity increases. And so this really was, was the impetus then to look at these guidance technologies not just from an engineering perspective, but from a human factors perspective, and understand what is the impact on the operator. And this is a schematic that I use with my undergraduate uh, students. Uh, a few of my under former undergrads are in the class today. I don't know, maybe I don't know if I was using this same picture back when you took the course with me, but I've always used this to to explain exactly what ergonomics is all about. Any time that you know, we as a, a human operator are interacting with any kind of a machine, there are two arrows of communication that we have to be aware of. I need to be able to give some instructions to that machine. That's the input. I also need to be able to get information back from the machine so I know what's happening. That's the feedback arrow in that in that schematic. 
And so basically what we're, we're now thinking about is this system where we've got the agricultural tractor, the sprayer, we've got the operator, we've got that entire system and we need to make sure that we are understanding how information is going to be shared uh, within that, that environment. So that really became then the focus of my research program. So that led then to, to uh, steps to, to develop a lab that would allow us to study this. To be able to study this interface, some of the research tools that we've used over the years, a driving simulator, we've used eye tracking equipment, and some of the evaluation criteria that we use are things like driver fatigue, mental workload, situation awareness, usability. So uh, it's not, you know, maybe many of us are, are familiar with other type of experimental work. You want to know the temperature of something, you take a therm thermocouple or a thermometer and you place it in there, you get a reading. It's, it doesn't matter, you know, any of us, we do the same thing, we're going to get the same reading. It's going to be 20 degrees Celsius. When we're talking about this type of human factors research, the metrics that we use are not nearly as specific or well, well defined. So we st I started out looking at driver fatigue, realizing that there's all kinds of, of hurdles if you're trying to do that in the field. And you know, one little simple example that I can share from one of our very early studies, <clears throat> we had developed a little device that would allow us to assess fatigue. It's based on the, uh, the frequency at which you can detect a blinking light. There's, there's a whole uh, body of literature that, that correlates this for you. And I had a, one of these handheld devices. We were using it in the field. I convinced my brother to be my, my, one of my subjects. And uh, it worked great, except then about an hour into seeding, something happened with the air seeder and he had to get up out of the cab and go and fix it. And so, you know, up until that point, we, you, you would sort of see a decline in terms of, or, you know, his fatigue level was, was increasing, I guess by getting out of the cab and doing some physical, act, physical activity, then his level of fatigue kind of went away again. You know, he was energized. And so we realized that ment or driver fatigue, for example, was probably not gonna work for us very effectively. And so we, we kind of moved forward and tried some of these different metrics. There were always problems that sort of led us to try something different. Uh, none of them are perfect. There's always, there's always challenges. Why a driving simulator? Another story, different, uh, different PhD student. We had uh, planned a study where we were, and we'd already recruited farmers to participate with us. We were going to do this during the spraying season. It happened to be probably the wettest May and June on history in Winnipeg. Every day it was raining and so we we couldn't get any, I mean, there was no spraying that was happening. When finally the weather broke and there were, you know, three consecutive days when there was no rain, the farmers just headed out to the field. They didn't contact us about coming out and in setting up our equipment in the, in the cab and whatnot. So we essentially lost a whole season worth of research and I decided that I wasn't interested in that kind of headache for my whole career. I was going to work at developing a driving simulator where we could control some of the variables. We would have the flexibility. Uh, we could plan planning and safety and so forth. And so it's not perfect. It's certainly there are limitations of using a simulator, but it was a cost benefit analysis of either running the risk of, of dealing with the weather or getting some useful information out of, out of this approach. So the first version of the simulator didn't look like a whole lot. <laughs> it, was, it was a cab from a 1970s uh, vintage versatile tractor. We added some joystick controls, we added some displays to it. Uh, some, uh, we came up with the idea of, we obviously didn't have an implement behind it, so we created some very, very simplistic devices that in this case, we were sort of repre representing uh, a sprayer, so 
this little bar would, this was, the idea was we were representing the height of the boom, so if the boom was too high, the, the operator had to press the button and lower it. If it was too low, then they pressed the button the other way and raised it. So we were trying to simulate the, the, the task as best we could. What this enabled was us to look at light bars. So this was probably about four years since that cam track system. By that point, GPS was becoming more prevalent, more popular. And so the technology of the day was the light bar. The light bar essentially was linked to a, a GPS receiver on the, the top of the tractor. And it was programmed based on the, the width of the implement that you were pulling. And it would tell you, ideally, you were doing a good job of driving and the three LEDs, the green LEDs in the center would be lit up. But if you were too far left or too far right, then red LEDs would, would light up. And the, the idea was that the driver would see this and they would have to make the, the necessary steering correction. So we started using this and we, we realized, well, you know, is there anything that we can improve with the design? And we looked into human physiology a little bit and realized that, and, and that in, con in connection with how the the farmer, the driver is interacting with the machine. Because one of the, one of the concerns that farmers were raising was that they liked the idea of the, of the light bar, but you know, it was placed stationary in front of them. And if they were standing or sitting there um, staring at this, it became very difficult. It was, you know, it was incompatible with the fact that they also still had to monitor everything else. So, Instead of creating a monitor that requires that sort of central attention, we thought because the operator is going to be scanning around, looking back, looking forward, why not take advantage of that concept of being able to see things out of the corner of your eye, the peripheral view. And physiologically, red and blue lights are much more detectable in our periphery than red, or sorry, Blue and yellow are much more detectable than red and green are. So we, we came up with some light bar designs that used yellow and blue lights instead of red and green and found that you know, there was actually great improvements to be had. I had a, uh, another uh, PhD student that was really interested in the simulator itself and wanted to see us sit, take it from this very crude simulator to something that was, you know, at, certainly at a higher level. And so I'm not going to go through a lot of details here, but we did things like adding resistance to the steering column so that, you know, the, the further off center you were, you'd get some torque resistance on the, on the steering column, which would be another cue to help you uh, get back on track. We added motion cues so that the whole, the whole cab would turn. We added the obviously the visual uh, view, and you know we made some we made some improvements I think, but we also realized that for the most part we didn't necessarily need all of these fancy features in the simulator to get the results didn't necessarily come out better for a lot of extra effort. Interesting story, however, there was I'll just go back to this picture for a moment. One, I had a visitor from, uh, an engineer from Case New Holland, was visiting my lab, saw this old versatile cab in my lab and said, you need something better. Never thought anything more of it. You know, he left, went back to Saskatoon. About six months later, I got an email from him one morning saying, I've got a cab, I'm sending it to Winnipeg, what's the delivery address? <laughs> so, it was amazing, but he sent me some measurements. It wouldn't actually fit into the freight elevator to get into my lab. <laughs> so I had to find a different lab and so forth. But nevertheless, we, we got the cab. It allowed us to, uh, to develop a second generation of the simulator, which had a much more realistic uh, environment. One of the, uh, 
again, a little bit of a tangential study. One of, our, uh, one of my students was looking at the ergonomic impact of different implement monitoring systems. And we borrowed uh, an infrared uh, camera from the grain storage group uh, so that we could measure elevated uh, or neck muscle activity. And we compared these three different uh, concepts of direct turning. So what the farmer would typically do would be to turn back and check out you know, if the cedar is working fine. That, that's the direct turning uh, scenario using the camera. So this was, a, again, a very similar to system to what I'd originally started out with, where you've got a display that you could put right in front of you and the camera looking back and seeing whatever it needed to see or uh, using the rear view mirrors. And, and we were able to you know, clearly show that there was, there was uh, uh, less muscle activity, which over time, I mean, I mean these, these would have been, uh, these studies that we did in the lab would have been over a, maybe a, an hour at most. It certainly wasn't magnified over the eight, 12 hour day that, that would be experienced during seeding time or harvest time and so forth. One of the other areas that we've, we've looked at over the years was, so how do you display the information? These three images on the slide here, they all show the exact same information. It, it, there, there's seven different parameters that are being displayed, but the effectiveness at which that information is, is available to the, to the driver is much different depending on how you how you go about uh, displaying it. And so, you know, when you start integrating this, trying to figure out what's the best layout of the information. So it's not only what, is, what are the key pieces of information, but how do you sort it out? How do you organize it? What colors do you use? How do you show uh, when, it, when the status is okay versus when it's not okay? All of these issues we started to to look at in terms, I mean, I mean the original, the, the initial reason for doing this was because we wanted to improve the display that we were using in the simulator, but we've now realized that, you know, we're, when we're starting to talk about autonomous machines, there's still the, the, the need to be able to remotely monitor them, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides coming up. This, this particular graph was, was uh, something that really, I think, started to change the direction of my research. Was something that came across, to the best of my knowledge, it's not based on experimental data. It was simply speculation by these authors. Basically what they were proposing here or speculating to happen, so we've got on the, on the x-axis is just time, is being uh, displayed here. They're starting out with a scenario where the machine is being operated manually. So the, the, whoever the driver is, or the, it doesn't have to be a driver necessarily, but whoever the operator of the machine is, that person is, is doing everything manually to start with. At some particular time, automation was turned on. And they've assumed, corresponding to that point of turning the automation on, that the system maybe wasn't designed very well, but there was less feedback being given to the operator. And so what happened, the y-axis in this graph is level of understanding. So that the operator no longer had an adequate level of understanding of what was happening until automation is stopped and then it would start to increase again. So th this, basically what they're trying to say is that when you automate a system, because the operator is still going to be, have some level of engagement with that system, one is that you probably need to put, put extra effort into designing the display to make sure that they don't lose a sense of what's going on. It's in the, the terminology that's often used is, there, is the operator out of the loop of what's going on. So we, we really need to be aware of that in order to, to make sure that we've got a, a system 
that is going to be functional. So one of my PhD students set out to try to see if we could gather any information that would sort of verify that this, these, these trends were in fact real. And so we, we uh, used our simulator, we came up with a study, we created four different automation modes they're highlighted in the red here, and, and basically they were just different. I mean, the, the whole theory behind automation is that it's not that it's manual or autonomous. There are a whole series of intermediate steps that, that define, it's not, it's not just a binary decision. And so what we did was we came up with intermediate steps that were sort of getting progressively closer to what would be considered autonomous. And I'm not going to focus on all the results. I'm just going to focus on this one last graph here. So we've got from manual and then these four, uh, three intermediate stages of sort of partial autonomy and then the final, which was fully autonomous. And what we... The, the results are not overwhelming. I mean, it's not like a nice, high, steep uh, slope to this. But the level of situation awareness was, was uh, the situational understanding was increasing as we were giving better information to the operator. But then in that final stage, when we turned it into fully autonomous, then their level of understanding did drop. So we had some evidence that that speculation on the previous graph was in fact uh, true. Now moving a little bit closer to where, where, we're, where we are today. So, and basically what's, <laughs> you know, those of you that are researchers in, in the room, you know that research is a lengthy process. We recruit grad students, they take courses, they, you know, so this, this all uh, takes a fair bit of time to, uh, to happen. And so, but technology doesn't stop. And so, by this point now about, this would be about 2017, that camera-based system, that's long gone. The company doesn't even exist anymore. Light bars are pretty much gone. I've totally jumped over, there was, there was a stage where auto steer systems were, were very common. That was the latest technology. I didn't even really have a student work on that because we just got to the point where we saw that the next logical step was autonomous, fully autonomous, autonomous machines. That, you know, the industry was getting close enough that, that I thought it was necessary to start looking at this particular uh, angle. Again, I've, because my background was grain storage and when I you know, made that original decision to go in this direction, I didn't want to get into the, the game of racing with everyone else to try to come up with the autonomous machine myself. I wanted to provide a complementary uh, piece of expertise. And when I started looking now at, at the, uh, you know, this particular autonomous tractor, I found some papers that had been published as early as the, you know, the early 2000s. At that point, they were, they were speculating of what the autonomous tractor was going to look like. And they, th these were two examples, they both clearly stated that they believed that there was going to be a, a need for the operator to monitor what was going on on some kind of a display. Now, I don't know if they were envisioning a tablet or a phone at that point in early 2000s, but some kind of a computer display. Recently, what I've had gone through was, uh, was looking at what industry is doing in this area. And I found that there are essentially four different concepts that are being researched, developed, put forward as, as the way that autonomous tractors might look in the future. So there's the first concept we described as retaining the operator station. And you know, one example that aligns with this is Monarch Tractor Company out of the US. Uh, so 
this concept, and there are pictures on the next slide, so you'll get to see what some of these look like. But this uh, first concept, you know, essentially the tractor still looks like a regular tractor. It will attach to the implements in the same way as, as any of the other tractors. It just has the option for the driver or the operator to e either be physically driving or to take hands off and let the tractor drive itself. The second option is to eliminate the operator station. So this seems reasonable. If, if we're making a tractor driverless, then we don't need a place for the driver to sit. And so, but uh, Case New Holland, John Deere, Kubota, the Autonomous Tractor Corporation, which is the, uh, the yellow one that I showed in this slide, those are examples of that concept where, again, it's still, the implement is going to attach to the tractor in the same way, but there's no place for, for me to sit when I go back to the farm to help out my brothers. I'm going to have to sit in the house instead of on the tractor. The third concept is what's called, or I've de described as an integrated tractor. The, uh, the only example that I'm aware of is, uh, is the DOT, or it's now been bought out, I think, by, by another uh, company. But here, the, uh, the tractor unit is integrated with the implements that it powers. So the idea here is, if we're starting, you know, if we're thinking about autonomous, why do we have to consider the tractor pulling the implement, which I read in, in a, you know, a, a history book of agricultural machinery at some point that you know, really the tractor pulling the implement is just a replica of the horse pulling the implement. The tractor was just replacing the horse. Well, the thought was here, why do we have to keep that same concept? Why don't we rethink everything and just integrate it into one unit? The final concept is the swarm or the fleet uh, concept and, and Fent out of Germany is the company that, one company that I'm aware of that's working on this area. And this is probably of, of all the ideas, the one that is maybe the least likely to catch on in North America because we like things big. Uh, this concept is to have a whole bunch of little tractors, uh, little machines that are autonomous going out and working in the, in the field in an organized manner. So here are just four, four pictures that represent those, those uh, you know, different concepts. So this, this is the dot. So in, in this case, you know, the, the power unit and the seating unit are integrated directly into one machine. And it, there's no need for that physical separation between the power unit that's pulling, pulling the implement behind. And you know, here are these little, little swarm uh, tractors that would going out into the field. So one of the and uh, Udwak is in the in the audience here. This was part of his uh, PhD work was to figure out if we were going to be remotely supervising. And this this was my hypothesis that if we're going to have autonomous machines, the farmer is going to want to know what's happening. They're not going to just blindly trust that everything is happening out in the field on its own. So if we're going to re need to remotely supervise these, where does it make sense to do that supervision from? So we, we talked with, uh, with some farmers, we talked with, with uh, people that are developing these, these systems, and we sort of came up with that there are four different concepts that were, were suggested. Uh, we did a little bit of a pros and cons of analysis of this, and, and certainly the, uh, the edge of the field supervision seemed to be the one that made the most sense. So just briefly what these mean, in-field supervision would be suggesting that perhaps you would be on one of the tractors, but that tractor would maybe be linked with, with several other tractors, and so you would be uh, supervising the others from, from your, your location but you would be in the field. Uh, edge of the field supervision, I've got a you know, fancy pickup truck that has air conditioning. I'm just going to sit on the approach and with my tablet, and I'm going to watch it from that, uh, that perspective. That's, that was the one that was seen to be the most uh, likely to, to be the uh, reality. 
supervision from the farm office. Well, my sofa at home is even more comfortable than my pickup truck. That may or may not be true, but that, you know, that concept that, well, why even go out to the field, just do it from, do it from the farm office. Or, you know, the last, you know, taking it to that, that next step that, well, maybe you even work off the farm and you can supervise it somehow from, from a remote location or you've taken the family to Florida and you're <laughs> monitor it while you're on vacation. So moving then to a little bit more of the, the nuts and bolts of this uh, remote supervision. One of the ideas that I had uh, heading into this was that the need for real real-time sensory information. And I guess it comes down to, uh, you know, remembering when I was a kid on operating machines on the farm and, you know, realizing how much information you get from what you see, from what you hear, what you feel maybe. Uh, and if you're taken out of that machine, doing, how much do we rely on that sensory information? So one of my PhD students in about 2017, 2018, we did a, a simulator study where we had essentially two scenarios where we had video uh, showing, a, in this case it was just a plot sprayer operating and different variables were changing with the, with the plot sprayer and the, our participants were asked to watch the video and detect when they saw problems or changes and they were supposed to indicate that on a, on a form. We had a second scenario where we uh, essentially assumed that we had sensors placed on the, on the sprayer and that instead of forcing the, the operator to watch the sprayer itself, the sensors would display the information for, for, the, for the operator. And we compared these, these two, to, two scenarios. We used eye tracking equipment. What's shown here is some of the heat maps that were generated, so it, it really focuses on where, where the, uh, the people were looking when they were asked to gather the information. One of the, this, this graph here is one of the, I think, the key findings that came out of, of this work. So, you know, as a good experimental study, we randomized the, the, the order in which these different trials were going to be displayed so we wouldn't be creating any bias. But in one instance, we, just, we looked at the trials in chronological order. And what we saw was that trial one, when there were these side-by-side -side displays, the participants didn't know which one to trust or which one to get the information from. So not surprisingly, they spent roughly 50-50 split, looking here, looking there. But by the 15th trial, we didn't have that same, same response. It was closer to a 70-30 split, where 70% of the time they were looking at the sensor data, and only 30% of the time they were looking here. So, the obvious conclusion from that study would be that we don't need visual information, right? There was a wrinkle because we asked, you know, once they were done the study, we had sort of an open questionnaire that, and it specifically asked if you, what you felt about the, having the real video. And overwhelming, every one of the respondents said, we need that visual information to trust what's going on. So even though we can probably display the information better as sensor data, they needed that in order to have trust in the system and recognizing that, you know, that trust is, again, I'm sitting in my pickup truck, I may not be able to see what's, what's actually happening there. I need to have some idea of what's going on. So this is what the current version of our, of our interface looks like. So we've integrated the sensor data with, with the real-time uh, video images. But of course, the, one of the challenges that we recognized was going to perhaps uh, cause us some grief was if we're going to, dis if we're going to transmit that, 
visual information from the field to wherever I'm monitoring from, how long is that going to take? And if, there, if there's too much of a delay, what kind of problems are that, is that going to cause for the operator? So we, this was fun, some uh, research that was funded by, by our Bell MTS um, money that came to the faculty. I recruited an electrical engineer because this is way above my head <laughs> to, uh, to be able to, to figure this out, but we uh, developed a system with hardware that would allow us to transmit the video. We used two different systems. We used a, a uh, cellular transmission. We also used an Ethernet radio transmission. But we also had to develop the hardware that would allow us to measure the delay, the transmission delay, from when it was sent to when it was received. That was, the, that was really the difficult part to, to get that. But we came up with it, we got the hardware to work, we set up uh, an experimental study where we had, uh, the hardware was, was mounted on my old lawn tractor, we, um, you know, different distances away from our receiver, we drove the tractor back and forth, we were transmitting video, and we were able to, uh, I mean, there definitely is a, uh, you know, the, the greater the distance is and so forth, the, the higher the resolution of the video, it, it does all increase the, uh, the, the latency or that, that transmission time. But in general, we found that it probably would be acceptable. Uh, now, the, the couple of interesting observations from this was that this worked really well when we did it on campus. It worked pretty well when we did it out at Glen Lee. When we got to Sanford, when we got to Elm Creek, cellular doesn't work so well. Because cellular transmission requires cellular signal. <laughs> and there are plenty of places, and we weren't in remote Manitoba by any means. I don't define Elm Creek or Sanford as being remote areas. But, and this was something that we pointed out to, to Bell <laughs> when we met with them, is that if they really want uh, what, you know, this kind of technology to, to work on farms in Manitoba, we need much better cellular coverage in order for it to, to work. But nevertheless, we, even if we had to rely on Ethernet transmission, this, this would work uh, to be able to have real-time uh, video. Last couple of slides here. This past summer, uh, you know, I've been constantly working to try to get a more realistic uh, system to be able to test with. I would love to be able to have one of those fancy autonomous tractors that I had access to, but I don't have the budget for that. So one Sunday afternoon I came up with the idea of the, you know, the little uh, Roomba autonomous vacuum, and uh, when I started looking into it, realized that Roomba actually makes a version of it that doesn't have a vacuum cleaner attachment. It's specifically marketed for schools. It's open source coding so that we, you know, we could you know, do whatever we wanted to, to control it. So we bought one of these for a couple hundred bucks and we were able to, uh, to set it up. Uh, there's a little video here showing that you know, we had it all driving back and forth through the lab and it was displaying, we had cameras mounted on it, it was sending it back to our, our monitoring station. So it's not we haven't done any experimental work with it yet, but it's, we've got a system that, that does kind of work. So again, unless I get that windfall and I can get the you know, Case New Holland prototype out at, out at Glen Lee or something, I'll have to make do with this, I guess. So just the last couple of slides, just some of the opportunities for future research that I see. Uh, I think there's, there's still plenty of work to be done in this visual information. One thing that we haven't looked at is what is the trade-off between uh, latency and, and the, the usability of that data? Uh, you know, we, we, can, we, can, we know that higher quality data is going to provide more information, but it's going to take longer to transmit. So we haven't, we haven't done that kind of optimization work yet. Auditory information, we haven't really looked at that as well. I, I remember vividly when I was operating our old 503 combine on the, on the farm back in the day, that if I, 
you know, I could hear the speed of the cylinder almost to the, I don't know what, to what degree, but I knew that if at a certain point, if I didn't clutch or slow down, I was going to be out there pulling stuff out of the front of that machine for a couple hours. So I very quickly got to understand how to interpret the visual, or the, sorry, the auditory information. And so again, that would be lost in a remote supervision uh, type of scenario. So is there a role to be played by that? Uh, don't know. Uh, effective warning modalities, uh, my current PhD student in, in the room today, th this is what she's looking at, uh, trying to, ev again, the idea is not that the farmer is going to be sitting in the pickup truck looking at this eight hours straight. The idea is that something goes wrong, we need to notify, get, the, get their attention. So looking at that aspect of the, of the interface. Um, and I guess the, the second bullet here, remote supervision of multiple machines. So you know, right now we've sort of been focusing on just the idea that you know, I'm, I'm just going to supervise one machine, but there's no reason why I, sh I couldn't have you know, three of those sprayers working simultaneously in different fields and, and monitoring them all simultaneously. And is there anything else that needs to be added in order to do that? And finally, there's a complete void in the literature on the area of shared situation awareness in human autonomy teams. What this means is that, uh, you know, if three of us are all air traffic controllers and we're working together, we have to be able to share the information that we individually gather so that collectively we can make the right decisions. There's a whole a great body of knowledge in the literature when you've got shared situation awareness amongst a team of humans. When you have a team that consists of one human and one autonomous machine, how do you, how do you generate that same shared understanding. So there's, there's a complete void in the literature on that. Uh, certainly an opportunity, I think, for future work. Acknowledging my, my research team over the years uh, and opportunity for questions. One thing I learned is that you have to be ingenious when doing research, you know? Find your tools, right? For 25 years you've demonstrated that, but let's open it up to questions on uh, Danny's presentation. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Um, when do you think this might actually have practical application in the field? Commercial. Well, I, I think that, you know, the fact that there are these, these images that, that exist, I mean, the, the, these companies are getting, getting very close. I think they're getting very close. You know, the reality is there, there is going to have to be some means by which you, you supervise these. And so it, it's going to happen with exactly when I can't predict, but it's, it's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's too many companies that are working on it. Um, there's, there's so many liability issues of having fully autonomous without any supervision that I'm, I'm convinced that there's going to have to be the interface that, to, to allow supervision. Yes? Yeah, the presentation. Um, you think that you're really interested in machines, but you are also interested in human psychology. Like how you first how you know, the person perceives, and I'm wondering if you collaborated with like the psychology department or anybody in that realm in machine operation. Yeah, not, yeah, I mean not directly. I, I mean I know that I have co-authored I think maybe one paper uh, with with one of the professors from psychology. I mean certainly some of my we we spend a lot of time reading the human factors literature, which most of the people, uh, you know, are, they're not necessarily engineers like myself that are writing th those papers, so we're, we're um, you know, we're, we're in, indirectly learning from, from that. But, but yeah, you're right. I mean, this is, that was, that was a very 
I guess, conscious decision on my part that at the beginning that I, I was going to look at, at this problem from a, a very different perspective rather than just focusing on the technology or the, you know, the machine design kind of perspective. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is a point that you bring up in the presentation, that there is a tendency to think that a uh, operator is not going to just look at one machine. At some point, it's going to be multiple machines. But is there any literature or study that has seen check like how many machines can an operator monitor by itself? I'm not aware that there's a, I haven't seen one that, that tried to answer that question. You know, the, the, I think there, there are papers, people that are speculating that it will be multiple, but I don't think anyone's tried to identify what is the maximum. So in that swarm case, the middle picture there, the third one, I mean, if you were to try to monitor all of those, I mean, you're gonna run out of attention span or bandwidth, yeah. right? It's an interesting question. The, I, the idea with the swarm is as much as possible that you sort of have a, you know, um, a slave, uh, what's the term I'm missing? As a follow up, uh, automation is in locations, then a way to like overcome shortage labor. But at some point, because the operator cannot monitor infinite machines, there is still going to be a need to know, like, well, I do need extra operators on the farm, but where do I draw the line? That's, that's right, although, I mean, the, currently, there is one operator for every machine. So even if we go to one operator, or one supervisor supervising two machines, that's already, you know, a 50% reduction in, in labor savings, right? So. You know, we don't necessarily have to get to one supervising 50 in order to make a big, big impact. I guess to kind of go along with what you just said, do you think that like the savings you get from getting rid of one person would justify the cost of the autonomous tractor? Like considering the fact that the tractors are already very expensive, how much more expensive would an autonomous tractor be compared to just a conventional? And then would you like, to hire a guy to operate a tractor, you're paying him, I don't know, like 50 grand a year. If even, maybe like 20 grand a season. So. Also, oh, now, now you're going into the philosophical route. I guess. <laughs> Where I will, I will confess that I'm not necessarily convinced that this is all a good idea. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, again, maybe my perspective is, is a little bit biased. I grew up on the farm. Um, I look forward to the opportunity in springtime, seeding time, harvest time to get back out and get on the tractor and get away from my computer and, and you know, drive it. I'm not sure that I would feel the same way about going out to the farm and sitting and watching it. Then I might as well just stay in my office <laughs> type of thing. So that's a, you know, I think of, a very good philosophical question and, and I, as I said, I, even though I've been working in this area, I'm not entirely convinced that it's all a great idea. Uh, nevertheless, you know, I, the, the industry is moving in that direction and I think at the very least there's, as a, my, I believe strongly that there is going to have to be supervision of these machines and that's where I, I've at least focused on that. The business case here is that, and I guess if someone's familiar with these field operations, you know that while there's typically a, an operator in the station of the sprayer or the seeder, there's also someone who is the supplying the tender. Uh, and that's the likely candidate to be the supervisor. So instead of having, you know, the, the, the many farms, the easy job is running the tractor and the, the guy who's working his butt off is the one who's delivering the product making sure they're in the right place at the right time. So I think, uh, you know, the metric on adequate supervision will have to include the factor that the person doing that is probably also operating a completely separate piece of machinery like a semi-truck, uh, a, a grain wagon or something. And so without, you know, say audio intervention that would, would alert you, um, that supervision 
probably going to be inadequate. Um, that would be my feedback. Yeah, and that's Anita's working on that right now. We're we're a study that we're doing where we're comp comparing how effective um, visual notification, auditory, and tactile. Because there's no labor savings if someone's sitting in a, in a now you're idling a $80,000 pickup truck. Uh, so you're actually wasting money. But as soon as you have the, the one farmer doing two jobs, right. then it's worth it. So that's, that's where the, the economic incentive is. But it's good. That's, that makes that job, which is already the more dangerous, more difficult job, unloading the truck, uh, that is going to make it even more complicated. The most, most common farm accident is, uh, is people backing their own uh, trucks over themselves, unloading seed and, uh, and water. So if you're already listening, if you're watching an iPad while you're doing that, that makes sense. It's not going to be any better. <laughs> Questions with any? Like you said, the companies are commercially available, like the rate of omnipower ratio there. Have you had a chance to look at their interfaces and compare it to what the research findings have shown and if there's a overlap with what they've done commercially? Well, you know, it, there's, there's the I guess the two issues, there's the just how all the components are arranged and you know that there's there's textbooks after textbooks that talk about different principles for arranging information. You know, ultimately, you know, individuals are going to have different preferences and so forth. So, I we haven't really focused on that part. Looking at what others have done, we've we've really been focused on on uh, understanding if we're if the in, intent is to incorporate real time information, how do we go about doing that? Th those logistics. That's that's been our primary focus. We've attempted, obviously, in the, the interface that we've created, we've, we've tried to incorporate the ergonomic principles from the, from the textbooks as best we can. Um, whether our, our design matches what the other companies have, probably not exactly, because you know, if you look at seven different ergonomics textbooks, they list the principles in different orders, and they have different, slightly different principles, so there's, there's not a 100% unanimity in, in terms of what is the right way to do, organize information. I, I'd like one more look at that graph that uh, showed the uh, information uh, situation awareness was early on. I think there's an edu and for us educators in the room, there's probably some real key, I think a couple more slides back. This now, one. So like when I'm teaching business farm management, I can give, I can give my students an Excel uh, spreadsheet that'll do all their numbers for them, but they learn nothing. Versus one where they've got to <laughs> do a little bit more work. Um, I think that's, that's kind of, we're, we're trying to find a sweet spot there. I wonder if you're better at understanding graphs than I, what's the sweet spot for how much uh, information is optimal? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how to, how to answer that. Um, I mean, at the at this stage, all all I can say is that we we gathered some information that I think verifies that there's yeah. some truth to this, but we didn't get enough that we could make a recommendation as to what is an optimum amount. I, I would find that result. You know, Phil, I, uh, one summer I sent my student, uh, my son and his uh, student buddy high schoolers to Danny's lab to check out driver error when you're texting and driving yeah. and attention spans yeah. associated with young people. So, I mean, it was quite surprising. So, uh, we'll talk about that further. Yeah. But I think generalizing this kind of situational awareness and understanding how much should be done by the user versus how much can be done automatically is, a, is probably the crux of the matter, right? But that could be generalized to other learning and yeah, task exactly. positions, right? Yeah, it's not just driving or automation, yeah. guys. But anyway, um, any other questions? We've hit 430. Yeah, yes, one more. One more on this graph. Uh, is this research mostly around maintaining situational awareness? Or 
monitoring only or regaining situation awareness? I I think theoretically the the goal should be to retain situation awareness if at all possible. I mean, otherwise, then you, you, if you're not retaining, then you're admitting that you've allowed the operator to fall out of the loop. And that, that's where it becomes dangerous or you know, challenging to, to bring the person back and fully aware. And I mean, there, I mean it, obviously it, it's, there's all kinds of trade-offs because if, if we are dealing with two different tasks at, at a time, you can't be 100% engaged in both of them. So the challenge is, is to, to keep the person in, engaged enough that the, the time to sort of regain that level of understanding is as minimal as possible, I guess is the, is the reality of what, what, what the goal should be. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's probably a lifetime of research in that graph. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everybody, and thanks, Danny.